The funding for this program is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Friends of 4, 10, and 12. Among other things this afternoon, the Land Board, which includes the Attorney General, the Secretary of State, the State Auditor, and the State School Superintendent, had a first-hand look at water samples collected on central Idaho streams. The clear water in this bottle was collected last month upstream from an operating mine. The water in the second bottle collected from a downstream, downstream from that same mine in central Idaho. After years of depression in the Idaho mining industry, things are starting to finally look up a little bit. Some observers even saying a mining boom is underway in this state. At any rate, the increased mining activity has led to an increased number of mine accidents that have caused environmental damage. And with the U.S. Geological Survey recently reporting a wealth of natural resource potential in central Idaho, the concern about mining impact on the environment can only deepen. Just yesterday, the state's attorney general filed suit against three mining companies, charging them with pollution, pollution, polluting several Idaho creeks and rivers in the central and northern part of this state. And two weeks ago, the state sued operators of the Golden Reef Mine, which is located east of McCall, charging severe pollution of a major tributary to the famous Middle Fork of the Salmon River. And as producer Gary Richardson reports tonight, that Golden Reef Mine incident went unreported for weeks. When Congress officially designated 2.2 million acres of central Idaho as wilderness, shown here in dark green, the area was carefully shaped to allow mining to develop. Now, some of the old mines on the edge of the wilderness, like Naranda and Sunbeam, are being reopened, and new mines like Amico's giant cypress mine near Chalice are being developed. Because of its many patented mining claims, the Thunder Mountain area east of Yellow Pine was excluded from the wilderness. This summer and fall, tons of mining sludge were spilled from a pond on one of those claims, the Golden Reef Mine at the head of Monumental Creek, seen here from the air. The material was drained from this pond into Mule Creek, leaving a thick layer of sediment in its path. Similar spills have occurred here before over the past couple of years, and pictures taken weeks after the spills show the murky waters of Mule Creek flowing into Monumental Creek. This summer's spills were first noticed by people working and camping in the area. And I was building an um, addition onto an existing log home and another small log cabin. And during that period of time, I camped out on Monumental Creek, about 20 feet from the creek. And when we first arrived there in June, the creek was uh, very pristine, clear, no silt. And uh, two weeks after we got there, we had to stop drinking out of the stream and using it for washing because of the amount of silt that was uh, coating the stream bed and just flowing freely down the stream. We were remonumenting the boundaries of their land, their patented claims, and we crossed the lower, lower drainages of Mule Creek and in several, well, in one wash, I should say, where there was no effluent before in two or three weeks previous with intermittent rain, et cetera, no runoff coming down it. All of a sudden there was an incredible amount of material and it was, was obviously mine tailings. There's a lot of clay up there. There's a lot of this carbonaceous matter and it creates a, a pretty singular looking substance. They were pushing all their crews up there. They were pushing everyone to get the mine on stream so they could start producing throughout this winter and I think it was a shortcut they thought they could take. Uh, originally, I, I had done a, a backpack trip down Big Creek with a girlfriend of mine, and uh, when we got back, uh, we were talking about the mining that was going, back, was going on in that area, and the pilot who flew us out had uh, uh, given us his concerns about Monumental Creek and the sludge that, and the silt and stuff that he had uh, witnessed in that creek and so in that discussion I became a little bit concerned at the time and it sort of went out of my mind until um, about a month later when I took a hike down the Middle Fork and when I got back from that hike I happened to read in the paper it was it was really ironic that I had just gotten back and I picked up the newspaper and there was an article in there about um, 
a, a cyanide spill, an 18,000 gallon cyanide spill uh, that had gone into Camas Creek uh, from the Yellow Jacket mine. And having just been there and experienced that area, I was, I was totally outraged, especially when I went on to read that, they, that the uh, spill wasn't um, reported for, for some time. In the early days, McCall, then known as Lardo, supplied the mining camps on the edge of the Idaho wilderness to the east of here. Then timber, also from the edge of the wilderness, became the area's number one industry. This mill here has been closed for several years now, and recreation and tourism have become increasingly important to the area's economy. Recently, with the rising price of gold and other minerals, the mining camps 40 miles to the east have been opening once again. And some people in this area are becoming concerned for the impacts that such mining activities might have on the wilderness so vital to the recreational economy. They're destroying um, the fish and the wildlife. Uh, and if you hike, if you're a backpacker, yeah, it would definitely affect, uh, it would definitely affect that aspect of, um, of tourism. Because I know there are a lot of people in the summertime who come up here to backpack. And uh, I, myself, I'm a backpacker myself, um, I wouldn't backpack in those areas if I knew that they were having cyanide spills. These areas are disappearing all over the United States and I think that it's a real shame to lose something that we have that other countries don't. And if, if you look at Europe for an example, um, Europe, the Europeans are coming over here to see the wilderness areas. They hardly have any left there anymore. And it's because of the mining and the uh, cutting of the forests and everything else that uh, they don't have these wilderness areas that we're lucky to have here. Bill Doris operates the McCall Air Taxi. He was a fish and game conservation officer in the area. I'm really not too concerned with it. I think they're doing as much as they can do uh, under some circumstances. I think they've had some problems. But um, it does cause problems in the fisheries when they let their tailings get away from them. I believe that in any wilderness area that the mining should be stopped, uh, especially on a large scale like that where they're uh, ruining a major uh, salmon spawning area. Uh, we've got a high value fishery uh, resource in that area and um, the effects from mining when uh, not properly controlled can be very detrimental to those fish. I think that if they're given the proper opportunities and, and uh, proper watches kept on them, I think they'll do what's right. If the values are there for the gold, well, they can surely afford to do it. The mining operations can you know, operate in these areas, but it takes these extreme measures to prevent degradation of these fish and wildlife habitats. In one sense, we're all concerned about mining. That, uh, that it doesn't destroy the habitat for animals or the ecology as far as the fish is concerned. But again, uh, I think the ecology for man comes first, that's jobs. And those people do provide jobs and they're spending a hell of a lot of money in this state and taking very damn little out, I think. So, you know, you gotta balance it out. Where's the good, where's the bad? The solution is, uh, I feel that if they don't, if they can't stop uh, the accidents that they're having, that, that possibly they should, they should consider not uh, letting a mine in the wilderness areas. Um, that's probably radical because I do know people who work for mines and they make a living doing that. But you can't sacrifice our water, you can't sacrifice our environment uh, for, for money. The technology exists now to uh, provide, the, to conduct mining and produce the minerals and, and uh, protect the, uh, or contribute to the uh, local economy and provide jobs and, uh, and the uh, national well-being and still uh, have maximum regard for the environmental factors. And uh, uh, I think it, uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, at all unreasonable that we can do both those things now. Idaho has only one full-time mine inspector at the moment, and he's with us tonight. Larry Jones is a mine inspector with the Idaho Department of Lands. Situations like the one we've uh, just seen 
discussed there in central Idaho. How common are they, Mr. Jones? It seems like they're getting more common as uh, this last year presents. It's just there's been a real influx in the increase in mining, uh, and especially some of the projects in the more sensitive areas and some of the projects with cyanide. I'd, I'd say I've probably been involved in maybe six to eight problems such as the scope of these in the last year. Uh, I mentioned earlier, and you did too, the uh, sort of the boom underway in the mining industry in this state. Does that relate directly to the increase in these incidents? Yes, I think it does. Uh, we had no cyanide heap leaching or maybe just one uh, vat leaching project with Delamar Silver, and now we've got maybe six to eight either ongoing or, or potential projects. Is, uh, is it uh, a question of the, just the increased number, or is it uh, the, the technology that's being used, or what, uh, what combination of events, uh, factors, mm -hmm. play to, to the problem? I think uh, you've got a lot of people getting into mining, and some of the problems with dredge and placer are that a lot of the people have moved into it because it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, it's easy if you have a bulldozer to just uh, build some ponds, buy a trommel, and start processing. It's not the major investment that you have in large-scale mining. And a lot of these people may not have the knowledge or ability to, to adequately design and engineer some of the structures. I see. Well, I said earlier that the Idaho Conservation League is calling today for more inspectors, more people like you, you being the only one in the state to cover 300 mines. How do you do that? I don't do it very well. I, I, I do as well as I can. I spend though, 12 to 14 days maybe in the field, uh, a lot of long days in the summer. Uh, and I work a lot with other agencies as much as I can, the Forest Service and, uh, and such to help be the eyes and ears. And I've been lately just keying in on problem areas, sort of putting out fires in the, uh, the so normal. So you're just getting to places where the problem perhaps already exists. Right. And then at the same time, I'll be looking at other sites when I'm there. But ma mainly, I'm just going to sites as the need arises almost. But as a practical matter, I guess, with that many mines and so few inspectors, namely one, that a lot of people don't get inspected at all, perhaps. Right. And I think a lot of the problems by the time I get there are so... Uh, so far along that a lot of that could be avoided if we had additional people to catch things more or less before they become a big problem. So the Conservation League today finally was calling for seven more inspectors, a total of eight in Idaho, spread some of them around the state. That would allow you to do a better job? Yeah, I'm sure it would. Uh, you, some of the sites almost need people there weekly, especially during construction, when they're doing these kinds of activities that could result in problems. We'll come back, sir. Thank you very much. A view now from the Idaho Conservation League and the official who testified before the state land board meeting in Boise today. Lil Erickson is the Conservation League's mining specialist. She lives in Salmon, Idaho. You asked for more inspectors today, I guess, for just the reason that Mr. Jones outlined, right? Yes, that's right. What, uh, what would those inspectors be able to do? Well, as Larry was pointing out, he would be able, they would be able to get to the mines, inspect them more often, see where potentials for problems exist, and the beginnings of problems before they get to be of such an extent that you're having whole tributaries uh, destroyed by the mining impacts, you know, whole fisheries destroyed. And, and we think that that's critical. Also, I think it would help to train the miners a little bit in, in practices that aren't so damaging to the environment because the inspectors recommend certain things be taken, certain uh, measures be taken. and. I, most of the time I think the miners would do that if they had that sort of direction. But without it, they continue to operate in what is the cheapest way and, and you have the problem. Well, as you well know, this is a battle that the land board will not, uh, will not ultimately decide, but the state legislature will. Did you uh, feel like you got much encouragement that the land board is, uh, is sympathetic to adding more inspectors? Well, I feel like the land board does understand the situation and they have supported more inspectors in the past. Um, we realize that the legislature is the body that deals with the problem, but we also realize that the land board has a lot of influence with the legislature. They are the experts on the issues and they make recommendations. I would have felt better if the land board had told us quite uh, strongly that they would be there supporting our recommendations. We didn't really get that from all of them, but I, I do think that uh, they will be suggesting to the legislature that more inspectors be funded. And as I mentioned, you would like, if that doesn't happen, if there aren't more inspectors uh, put into the field, you would like to see a moratorium on, on the issuance of new permits. That's correct. Uh, bring it to a halt right where it is now. Yes. Okay. 
Uh, you're also proposing, as I understand it, some specific changes in the mining in mining laws. I don't want to get into all the specifics, but in general, what sort of things would you like to see changed? Adequate bonding, for one thing, um, based on actual cost of reclamation rather than on some nebulous number. Right now, the Surface Mining Act has a $750 per acre reclamation figure, and that that doesn't come close to covering most of the reclamation costs. In other words, have mine, mine owners guarantee up front that they would have the money to clean up uh, something if they made a mess. That's right. By posting a bond, it gives them the incentive to do the actual reclamation. If they default on the bond, then the state has the money to go in there and reclaim those areas. That's critical. Also, the punitive uh, measures should be clarified so that uh, if a situation exists where legal action has to be taken, the the state knows going into court that they could win the cases. Um, right now, those legal actions are, are questionable, really. And we feel that this, this, both the law should state very strongly what the punitive measures will be, what the enforcement action will be. Right, okay. Let me ask you finally. Uh, you heard Mr. Jones say that this problem is getting more and more serious all the time. I guess you've, you've, you believe that, too. Mm, very much so. And it will what, only continue to get more serious as more, more and more mine activity comes online in Idaho? Yes. Um, one of the things that ICL is very dedicated to is that we believe mining can exist and that it's a, a legitimate use of the resource, but that it should be responsible mining and that the state and the citizens of the state have to force that responsibility on the companies. They won't do it without it. I really believe that they won't. The Dewey or the Golden Reef Joint Venture is a, is a good example of that. That's the mine we saw in the videotape right. earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll come back. Thank you. Some reaction now to all of this from perhaps the viewpoint of some mine operators in this state. And for that, we go to Art Zerold. He's a private mining consultant now. He's the former chief of the Bureau of Mines for the State Department of Lands and also a mining engineer. First, Mr. Zerold, do we need more inspectors out in the field? I believe so, Mark. I believe the department needs to utilize their existing manpower and their budget to the maximum possible, and perhaps some improvements can be made in that area. But certainly one person, considering you have about 650 permitted surface mining uh, activities in Idaho and an additional, perhaps active, 50 to 100 dredge mining sites, most of which are fairly small, it's very difficult for one man to do justice to the job. You've heard uh, both Ms. Erickson and uh, Mr. Jones say that this problem of mine, mines causing pollution in one way or another is getting more and more serious all the time. Do you agree with that? I think not. I think the problem perhaps has always been, been there. Uh, certainly perhaps it may be increasing because of the increasing level of activity, mostly associated with gold and silver developments in the state. I don't know if I can adequately address the uh, opinions of the industry, but I would think they're probably only cautiously optimistic about the future. And certainly the highest level of optimism would probably be associated with gold and silver. Certainly this is where the venture capital is being directed to. And with the increasing level of activity, both in exploration, development, and production, uh, and due to poor management uh, and poor operating uh, uh, standards by some of the operators, some new problems undoubtedly are developing. I don't think this is characteristic, though, of a well-run operation. So do we have just a handful of uh, bad actors, so to speak, who are causing the real problems while the rest of the industry is, uh, is doing a good job? Is that what it comes down to, in your view? I can't quantify it. I personally have no experience with the operations uh, recently in Valley or Custer County. I have worked extensively in recent years uh, with both new operations and ongoing operations involved in Benoit, Leita, Shoshone uh, County, and Boise County in the uh, Hawaii County area. I've seen many operations that have approached their responsibilities on the right foot in advance uh, and made the necessary investment uh, to put together an operation which is compatible both with the environment and meets the requirements of the laws and with good management, and that's very important, have uh, been successful. Uh, and I recognize certainly on many operations, accidents do occur. Frequently, it's, uh, they should not have occurred. Uh, I'm sorry to see that they have happened. But there may be not, w we shouldn't overreact to the, to the number. If I'm hearing you correctly, I think that's what you're saying. We shouldn't overreact to the number of incidents that we have had. 
I think that's correct. I would not belittle them. I think action should be taken to control them, but I would not necessarily overreact. Okay. Well, let me open it up on that point and invite all of you to get back in. How about that, Mr. Jones? Um, he's, I think there's a little bit of disagreement here about how, how, how widespread these problems really are. I, I tend to agree with Art when you look at the total workload and how many <laughs> responsible miners there are. The problems are not that widespread, but it just seems that they're, they're real dramatic when they do occur, and uh, they tend to focus a lot of attention. Uh, I think we can, we can get a handle on some of that pretty easily once we start to really uh, have, have more people in the field, have more of a relationship with the miner all the way through. We'll, we'll be able to short circuit some of those. Some, uh, some preventive big action. Would, would, uh, would more inspectors help in that way to, to prevent uh, what problems that uh, are, are out there that do exist? I think so. Primarily for the operator who has not sought professional guidance in advance and where they do not uh, retain or employ th that type of uh, competence on their own staff. If uh, the requirements of the law and certainly the standards were brought to their attention, they would be able to uh, give due consideration to that before they get too much invested, too much time under their belt, and they're too far down the stream uh, to the point that becomes financially very difficult for them to back up and do it correctly. Ms. Erickson, I think uh, he's saying that there are a lot of good operators out there and we shouldn't overreact <coughs> and uh, perhaps uh, be punitive with the good operators. Well, I agree that there are good operators out there, but I don't think that we're overreacting at all. Um, in fact, the punitive measures that would be uh, included in both those laws would do nothing to harm a good operator. They would only ensure that action are taken against the bad operator. Um, good mining operations don't have a thing to fear from anything that we proposed. Uh, the mine operators see it that way? I think so, and I think perhaps uh, with the comment there from Lil would be a good opportunity to bring forth the recent actions of the Small Miners Advisory Committee that was formed this past year by the State Land Board. Upon the request of small miners, uh, some difficulties they were having uh, being able to comply in an orderly fashion, in a timely fashion, with the state's dredge and, uh, dredge and plaster mining protection act. Their concerns at that time were primarily associated with the initially high bond required uh, and some of the fees that were imposed upon them, but not necessarily imposed upon miners operating either in the surface mining class or in the underground class. Well, Ms. Erickson, I think is proposing a change in the way those, those uh, bonds are paid now. Uh, do you agree with what, what she's talking about there? Yes, and I think that has been the recommendation of the Small Miners Advisory Committee, which has now completed their work and made their recommendation to the full land board. I might mention that Small Miners Advisory Committee was composed of three small miners, uh, three representatives uh, of the land board, and three representatives of the public, of which I was one. And the recommendations did strongly encourage the board uh, to in turn encourage the legislature to adopt actual cost bonding and also an inspection fee standard which was uniform throughout the state. And that's, and what, that's what you'd like to see too. Yes, and ICL also participated in that Small Miners Advisory Committee. And those inspection and fees would uh, go to help pay for more uh, Larry Joneses, right? right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let me ask you all about uh, this other point that was discussed at some length today and the ICL suggested that should these inspectors not be come online, that a moratorium be placed on new permits. How would mine operators feel about that? I think they would have some, probably goes without saying, Mark, they'd have some real reservations. Myself, working both in the capacity as an uh, engineer and as an attorney, have some real, of course, legal questions on whether it would be wise for the board to do that. Certainly in the case of the Surface Mining Act, there's a requirement in the law that the state land board has 60 days to review the application. It would be very difficult for the board to impose a moratorium, I believe, on such a review when it's codified that there is only 60 days available for the so review. So the state might not have the legal ability to, to impose a moratorium. I think that's like very that. likely, and certainly that's the, uh, the wisdom of the board's action today by temporarily tabling this request uh, pending opportunity to make a close legal review of that. What about the legalities, Ms. Erickson? Well, we haven't consulted attorney on, uh, an attorney on that. That probably is a problem, but uh, it has been brought up before the land board as a possibility by other people besides ICL. And I think the department has looked at it themselves as, as just a necessary means. Um, 
we believe that the state has legal responsibility to protect the A necessary means of not letting the problem get more, right. more and more out of mm -hmm. hand. Okay. Just beyond their scope of being able to handle. And we believe that the state has a, a legal right also to protect the environment and uh, the health of the citizenry. And if they can't do that, maybe you have conflicting legal uh, terms or laws. But I don't know. I hope the Attorney General will rule on that as well. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Jones, how, uh, the, uh, my understanding is the department proposed its own limited moratorium to begin immediately. That's what the board uh, decided not to take action on today, on just dredge and placer mining, which is a fairly small uh, percentage of what we're really talking about here. All right, there's approximately 65 active uh, dredge and placer mining permits, and there are 16 pending now applications. And they, based on the report that was presented, from what I understand, probably feel, the department feels, it, uh, it's already ex over what one person can handle. And it's questionable whether or not in a good faith they should approve anymore, knowing they won't be inspected and knowing they won't be monitored adequately. That was the, the, the gist of it. The other problem you have with that, though, now if we don't approve the permits, then we end up uh, filing injunctions and court actions because the people will still be out there and still need to be, you know, monitored in some way. Right. Well, let me just ask you, uh, Ms. 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 Erickson first uh, for a prediction from the legislature. I, you know how tight-fisted the Idaho legislature is about approving uh, money money for new people. Um, that right or wrong about what you're requesting, uh, what, mm -hmm. are, what are the chances of it happening? Well, we understand that that's the major crux of the problem and that in, in our proposals we have recommended ways of funding the inspectors by increasing uh, the application fee in some cases and stating an application fee and having an annual inspection fee associated with their receiving the permit. Also looking at um, a maybe more thorough collection of the mine license tax and if that won't do it increasing the mine license tax or even possibly imposing a severance tax. Some Somehow enough money has to be gathered to pay for the inspectors and it becomes the job of the legislature to do that. Well, you've got the last word, I'm afraid. Ms. Erickson, thank you for joining us tonight. Ms. Mr. Zidle, thank you. And uh, Mr. Jones, thank you. We appreciate it. That's our report for tonight. We'll be back with another tomorrow. I'm Mark Johnson. Good night. The funding for this program is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Friends of 4, 10, and 12.